I'm Michael Rickards, the Executive Director of the Hall Institute of Public Policy. And today on our television forum, I'm pleased to have an important guest, Dr. Lawrence Decker. Doctor, welcome. We're glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. You have a very interesting background. You have a PhD in clinical psych mm -hmm. from Brigham Young. Uh, you have been a fellow at the uh, Menninger Foundation. Of course, we're all well aware of it. But you're also in the forefront of what I think is one of the most interesting movements, and that's the relationship and the integration of the relationships between mind and body. We've heard people talk about that. There are whole schools of people that have been involved in that. But you have focused in a very interesting direction, and that is the whole question of cardiac wellness, especially for those people, executives who have had a heart attack. Tell us a little bit about, uh, first of all, your two books. The first one, A Change of Heart, which I can tell you honestly I have read, and your newest volume, Cardiac Wellness. Now, how do I get copies of these if I want them? Uh, Am Amazon.com, Amazon okay. sure. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your background and tell us a little bit about what you're trying to do with the question of heart disease and uh, also with servicing the needs of executives who've had a uh, considerable number of problems, obviously, with cardiac difficulties. Well, I guess you could say my interest in this field started with uh, my father, who uh, had bypass surgery at age 53, um, and later on became a psychologist. Uh, so I kind of watched what was happening to him. And then, of course, uh, a little bit later in life, uh, I became a psychologist, and I also had quadruple bypass surgery. Um, at age 54. So uh, it kind of got me thinking, you know, what is there about family genetics or what is there about personality that um, is related to heart disease? Because my father was a psychologist, I'm a psychologist. We had very similar uh, type A personalities. Type A, for those people who don't know what that means, are people who are highly motivated workaholics. Right, hard driving, competitive, uh, impatient, um, uh, success oriented, sounds, achievement sounds oriented. Sounds familiar. Sounds familiar to you, <laughs> <laughs> to me too. <clears throat> so both my father and I were this way, and it got me to thinking about what was there, was it all my genes, or was my personality involved in this as well? And I began looking at my patients uh, in a slightly different way as well. I, I began to think about their lifestyles and why it was that so many of my patients were having difficulty sustaining the lifestyles they needed for uh, healthy hearts. They, uh, they, they knew what to do, and I knew what to do. I, I knew what not to eat. I knew I needed exercise. Question was, why couldn't I stick to a heart healthy lifestyle? And why couldn't my patients stick to a heart healthy lifestyle? And that's what sparked me to write these books. Give me an idea, really, of how to sustain the lifestyle changes, as you've said, for, for a healthy heart. How do you, we, we all know <laughs> we're not stupid. We see it in newspapers, we receive endless magazines, we know, but yet we really don't quite stay on the fat-free diet. We want a cheeseburger. We don't really want to do exercise. It's boring. Yet we, how, how do we move out of knowing to acting and behaving? That's a great question. I think you have to understand the forces that are interfering with your healthy lifestyle choices. And uh, I would say the major force is stress. Uh, my heart patients are uh, exhausted and depleted. A lot of them don't know it. Um, the exhaustion and the depletion robs them of energy. And you need energy to make good choices. You need energy to uh, exercise willpower. 
There have been a lot of uh, research and experiments on willpower. Mostly at uh, Florida State University, uh, a fellow named uh, Dr. Baumeister has conducted experiments which show that if you, um, that willpower is a very um, expendable energy. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, how shall I say, it's, it's easily depleted. And if you exercise willpower in some areas, let's say you're at a party and uh, you meet somebody you don't particularly like and you want to say some things about that person that you decide maybe I shouldn't say those things. That's exercising willpower. And uh, when you do that, you're going to have less energy available to resist those potato chips when they, when they come around. The more you exert willpower in one area, the less willpower you have in another area. Let's say you're at a movie, and they did this experiment, where you're uh, seeing a sad movie and you're being told that you should keep your uh, feelings in. Don't cry even though it's a very sad movie. Um, if you do that, you're exercising willpower. When you get out of the movie and they give you a task of some sort, you're going to show you have less willpower to exert on that particular task than you ordinarily would. So will, willpower is easily depleted. And my heart patients were exhausted because of the stress they were under. Now you might you might ask, well, what kind of stress are they under? Well, we're we all live under stress. We live in stressful times. You know that. But my heart patients tend to be under more stress than most people, and I think it's because of their backgrounds. And we can get into their backgrounds, but um, basically it has to do with their minds, how they interpret events. Okay, you focus mainly on executives who are in stressful situations, make a lot of decisions, that's what they're paid to do. You're assuming that willpower is a constant. How do you increase your willpower? How do you increase the amount of energy, quote unquote, that is in that willpower packet? Well, you is there a way something yeah. I can do that would well, increase? Yeah, sure. My willpower were depleted uh, without simply stopping doing what I'm doing. Uh, there's several things you could do. Um, the more you do exercise willpower, the more your willpower increases. So even if you do silly little things like new things, like uh, uh, put your put your pants on uh, with your right leg first instead of your left leg or uh, catch yourself when you say, mm, uh, before saying, mm, uh, start exercising some self-discipline in those areas, that tends to build uh, uh, willpower, builds energy. You know, the, the brain is only 2% of body weight, but yet 20% of the energy that you consume is used uh, by the brain. Why? because uh, self-control is a survival characteristics. So um, you really need to exercise self-control. Heart patients need to exercise self-control in order to live a healthy lifestyle. Then you have to ask yourself, well, what is there that inhibits the exercise of self-control? What is it that drains your energy? And I think it, it's... Uh, it's uh, beliefs that people, what I call false beliefs that people often have that um, require them to exert all kinds of energy defending. Give me an idea of a false, false belief. Um, I, I, uh, I, I have to keep my guard up. Uh, I have to um, uh, smile at everybody. Uh, I, I can't let anybody know who I really am. Um, I have to keep my act together. Have, I have to uh, have a smiley face. So the masks of life are killing us. Well put. Uh, for some of us with bad genes, if That's you right. will, um, these masks kill us. You know, when you think about 
Uh, did you ever hear of the, the normal curve? You know, it's a curve that kind of goes like that. And uh, it's called the bell curve. And if you think about the bell curve, and you put a line on this side and a line on this side, you have 6.5% of the population over here, one standard deviation away, 6.5% of the population over here, one standard deviation, and most of us are right in the middle, 87%. Now, on this side, you've got people who, um, they could eat anything they want. They could you know, be a 300-pound gorilla, and their genes are going to protect them, and they're not going to get heart disease. That's, let's call that 6.5% of the population. On this side here, you've got 6.5% of the population that um, they're going to die no matter what. Think of Jim Fix. Right. You know, he took care of himself. He was a great runner. He was a great runner. He right. di it didn't matter. Uh, in this, this percentage of uh, the 6.5% over here, the bad genes, um, that's going to, no matter what you do, it's not going to matter. But for most of us, genes and lifestyle uh, interact. And we can do a lot about uh, our heart health. The 87% in the middle can do a whole lot about our lifestyles and our heart health to, um, to be healthy. How do I get to be the guy in the 6%? They can do whatever he wants. On the other end. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> you, you would have had to pick your, your parents. Your grandparents, well. <laughs> right. One of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Herbert Benson at Harvard Medical, had written a book called The Relaxation Response, in which basically he's telling people to deal with con stress, the major component of what you've identified here, uh, through the use of uh, what he calls relaxation response. It's a form of, I guess, transcendental meditation where people sit, they repeat a word or a syllable, actually. It's a nonsense syllable. And it's supposed to have enormous impact on their blood pressure and on other of their vital signs. Does that make sense or is that yeah. just something we like to believe in? <laughs> no, it makes a, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, one, of, one of the techniques I teach my patients is uh, a different form of breathing. Right. I, I kind of prescribe a, uh, an exercise where I ask them to breathe in and then breathe out. And internally, when they breathe out, when they exhale, count one to themselves. And then breathe in and then breathe out and count two. And do that. That's deep. Belly breathing. Belly breathing. Not, so you, not up here. No, well, your hands are on your belly. You're breathing in, so your belly should go out. Right. Then you breathe out. You count one to yourself, then you breathe in, and then count two. And you do that until you count five. And then after you count five, you repeat the cycle again. Now, do you think that people would have an easy time doing that? You'd think so, but they don't. What happens is they get to six, they get to seven, they get to eight. What happened? What happened was they lost focus. They, they ended up in their mind, and this is the major problem. How many times are you supposed to do it? Five. They do it five times and then repeat the cycle. How many times are you supposed to do the cycle? You should go through it for maybe ten minutes each and day. And people can't... Stay unfocused, you're saying, for right. that long a period of time. Right. Well, they can't stay focused on their breathing. They uh, they're thinking about the sales meeting I got tomorrow. This, this is exactly, and this is the main problem that I find with my heart patients. They can't stay present. They, uh, they spend most of their time in the past. Their attention is in the past, or their attention is in the future. Think about yourself. Think about... Um, type A personalities, okay? Where do you think we spend our time? Well, we spend our time not here and now, mostly. We're thinking about things. We're, you know, the here and now is like a temporary stepping stone, a, a, an inconvenience to get somewhere that's going to be more fulfilling. You know, sometime in the future, you know, we're going to be 10 pounds lighter. We're going to be famous. We're going to be wealthy. We're going to be loved. We're going to have all these wonderful things in the future. Or 
sometime in the future we've got to prepare <coughs> or otherwise we're going to worry about this or be fearful of that. So type A people are very much future oriented, but there's a second type of personality that uh, is past oriented that has also been uh, at high risk for heart disease and we call these type D. For type D? D type D. Uh, it's fairly new. Uh, this has been out of research in the Netherlands, Dr. Denole. And he found that there's a certain class of people who are distressed. That's the type D. And these people have a lot of negative feelings. Um, they're angry. They're sad. Uh, they're upset. But they keep the feelings in. They're afraid that, you know, maybe people won't people like them. Like them. Uh, I'm, I might burden you if I told you how sad I was. Um, and so they can't express these feelings, and they're sort of stuck with them. And so they're kind of in the past about worried, upset about things that happened that made them angry, things that happened that made them sad. And they keep rehearsing these things. And it takes away from their self-esteem. Well, what is the clinical definition of sad? And how do people get out of being sad? You, you, you get out of being sad. It's easier to describe that than go into a technical definition of sad because we all know sad. You know, when we feel lethargic, we feel like not doing anything. We don't want to go out and exercise. Maybe we cry. In a severe case, we have suicidal thoughts. Uh, but how do we get out of these feelings? How do we get out of worry, uh, fear of the future, or sadness or anger from the past? Simple. We come back to the present. And we, the present is all we have. You know, you, you, you've never thought anything, done anything, experienced anything outside of the present moment in reality, and in reality, there's nothing wrong right now. If you think about now, which is not 10 minutes from now, uh, or 10 days from now, but just now, you and I are having a great conversation. We're comfortable, there's, you know, it's not too cold. We're not, we're not starving to death, you know, we're not worried the roof's gonna fall in. Now it's pretty good, it's pretty, pretty comfortable. So, when you ask yourself, is there anything wrong right now, the answer is no. But that's not where we hang out. Our in attention is in the past if we're distressed, or in the future if we're type A. Now tell us a little bit about what you're doing in terms of putting together your own center or institute to operationalize some of these insights and who your clientele will be. Thank you. Well. Uh, you, you may know I've done quite a bit of executive coaching uh, over the past 12 years and I've also, um, I've also had a Center for Cardiac Wellness which I started in uh, Lahaska, Pennsylvania right near Peddler's Village and I set up a second office in Spring Lake, New Jersey where I live. And uh, in, in those offices I see primarily uh, cardiac patients. Uh, and most of those patients have been uh, executives and who have uh, uh, been under a lot of stress and their companies may have sent them because they're worried about their health and if they're in an important position in the company, the company can't afford to lose a CEO uh, and start all over again. Their people are irreplaceable. So the company is willing to pay to have uh, a... Uh, cardiac CEO um, coached. So, um, so I see people in my offices and uh, I just, uh, by the end of this week, I hope to have my website completed. It's called yourexecutivecoach.com and uh, I'm going to be offering this kind of coaching to the world out there, more of an educational program based on my book and based on some of the readings and films that I've given to my executive, my, my corporate clients. Could you, uh, in the corporate life, could you do this uh, 
by having them bring you in for the whole corporation or for the management level of the corporation. Sure. To essentially do what you, you know, sort of development, uh, the development days and seminars that corporations love and that people don't really get much out of. <laughs> Instead, do that and say, look, your health is of importance to us and we're going to bring this expert in on cardiac wellness and he's going to tell you, really, the types of things that are in here. I think can that you do it just for an individual, I'm saying, or do you, can you do it for a whole group? Well, I can do it for a whole group. Um, is I, it as effective? I, I haven't done it in groups. Uh, the kind of group work I've done in corporations have been in uh, how to be a better leader, yeah. leadership development. Um, I'd like to introduce th that in, in health psychology, uh, health wellness uh, seminars and could easily do that in corporations. Haven't yet. Do your principles of how to be a good leader create the very stress that results in cardiac problems? Sure. If, if you... I mean, the demands of being a good leader, not just simply a manager, but a leader, is that what creates the stresses that leads to Heart attacks? It's, it's a question. Are they working to, at cross purposes? It's a question of how you lead and, you know, whether you're authentic in your, in your leadership, uh, whether you have blind spots, whether, like some of the coach, some of the, the executives I coached had blind spots where they didn't understand that their employees were scared to death of them. And they were afraid to come to the executive with, with bad news. Because the executive, knowingly or not, shot, no bad news, huh? shot shot the messenger. So, uh, and and does the does the leader have emotional intelligence? I find that a lot of my heart patients are a little bit um, deficient in emotional intelligence. They don't recognize their own emotions. They, it's more it's easier for them to talk about logic thoughts than it is to get into their feelings and a lot of them are kind of blind to their feelings and have to be educated. If you don't know your feelings you can't really be empathic with your with your charges. Now you have a website coming up in yes. the next day or so. Yes. And you've got a second volume that's out already called Cardiac Wellness. Yes. And uh, that'll give our people a good introduction I want to thank you for spending time with us. My pleasure. It's been extremely enlightening, and uh, I hope people will come and follow up and see the types of things that you're talking about. Lawrence Decker speaking to us on the whole question of cardiac wellness. Thank you very much.